Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'm here today with Chad Woodruff. Uh, thanks, Chad, for joining me for this discussion about your book. Thanks for having me. So let me give a little bit of background about uh, who you are. You're a professor at the Department of Psychological Science at Northern Arizona University, and it looks like you're in your office yep. <laughs> right now, right? You're there Absolutely. at your, your university. Working and, hard. Uh, Working hard. Working hard, uh, looks like you're, you are, yep. And uh, you're a social neuroscientist, it says here that uh, in your research aims to elucidate the brain mechanism underlying empathy, sympathy, and compassion, as well as religious belief. And you use the uh, electroencephalography, EEG, to measure various brain signals, investigating how these signals relate to social neuroscience topics and the EEG is where you put those little little, uh, little caps on or little measurements and then you kind of measure the brain activity. And exactly, pick out the electrical, uh, electrical brain activity on the scalps. Okay, and the reason we're talking is uh, because you came out with this new book. Uh, it's uh, The Neuroscience of Empathy, Compassion and Self-Compassion, the first uh, edition and you're the uh, co-editor with uh, Larry Stevens and you have several chapters you've written in the book as well as a lot of other uh, contributors uh, you know, have done different chapters so we want to uh, talk about uh, about your book and kind of what, what it's about okay okay so how'd the book come about like uh, what does it, it's, it's quite a dense I mean it's serious yeah. you know academic uh, book how, how'd it come about yeah, well, uh, somewhat by luck, I guess. Uh, my colleague, uh, the co-editor Larry Stevens, um, has had a, a National Science Foundation grant. Uh, he had it running for about nine or ten years there. It was a it was a training grant called Research Experience for Undergraduates, and so we'd bring in uh, uh, eight interns each summer uh, to to do some full time research, and it was it was a wonderful program because you know it was highly competitive. So we got really the best of the best. Uh, students coming in here and doing research with us, and um, Larry had it set up to where uh, after uh, the the following summer each year, the, that group of students, that cohort, along with their mentors, mentors such as myself and Larry Stevens and some other folks from from the psychological sciences department, we would go to a conference like the American Psychological Association conference and do a symposium and uh, talk about the so so the. The research experience for undergraduates program we had was called the psychophysiology of compassion, and uh, and so that's the basic topic on which our um, uh, our symposia would go. And one year at the symposium, uh, the editors or some folks from Elsevier Publisher uh, they approached us and said, "Look, we noticed the the topic of your uh, of your symposium and wondered whether you'd want to put together a book." Hmm. Uh, to uh, to discuss that and we well heck yeah so um, <clears throat> so we uh, we said yes to that and uh, and then spent gosh at least a year and a half maybe a couple years working on it um, and we uh, of course an edited volume means that uh, we did some of the writing as as you mentioned uh, authored some of the chapters but uh, also had contributing authors from from uh, from uh, other places uh, joining as well so uh, so it was really just uh, them approaching us at the conference thinking that you know. Empathy, compassion, and self-compassion sounded like a, a pretty interesting topic. Uh, I guess they felt there weren't any uh, books out there that were necessarily addressing specifically those set of topics. And, uh, and so, yeah, we just went from there and um, kind of put the, the chapters together, thought conceptually what we wanted, and then we uh, went out shopping for uh, authors to help us write some of those chapters. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some, some colleagues here in our department at Northern Arizona University, but uh, some uh, in other places of the United States, and uh, even uh, even a, a, a couple of authors from Germany, as well. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's just what I think about how it came about. Yeah, and how about your interests? Like, you have a must have a personal interest in the topics. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, how how that come about? That you're actually you know sort of dedicating some of your career or around this uh, topic of empathy and compassion and self compassion. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, uh, I was trained as more of a cognitive neuroscientist, so I, I early in my career, graduate training and, and then a postdoctoral fellowship, I did looked at stuff like uh, uh, using something <clears throat> called magnetoencephalography, which is similar to electroencephalography, looking at visual attention and, uh, 
But then I got a postdoctoral position at University of California, Irvine, where uh, I started using functional magnetic resonance imaging to look at uh, episodic memory. And, uh, and then it came time to become a tenure track professor myself with my own lab. And I, I took a big risk by saying, I want to do something completely different. Um, you know, typically you want to move into your tenure track position, <clears throat> having, uh, you know, building off of what you built in, in graduate school and perhaps in a postdoc. But, uh, and I had no problem with visual tension or episodic memory, but I had just heard about mirror neurons uh, at this time and then heard that uh, EEG might be able to measure mirror neurons. <clears throat> and, uh, and I knew I was going to be setting up an EEG lab, so I thought, well, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to shift over to look at these mirror neurons. And, um, <clears throat> and of course, empathy is believed to be related to those mirror neurons. And so empathy kind of became my, um, my content area at, uh, simply because I wanted to look at mirror neurons. Um, but once I, uh, once I started relating the, that brain activity to empathy, I started talking to others, like Larry Stevens uh, had been doing some research on compassion. And of course, there's a pretty close connection between empathy and compassion. And, uh, and so we were kind of, um, uh, I don't know if bedfellow is the right term for that, uh, but uh, we both enjoyed talking to each other about our research. And, uh, um, and so from empathy, I've kind of gone a little bit into compassion, although strictly speaking, in terms of the actual experimentation I've done with the EEG, uh, I've always operationalized my construct as empathy. So I really claim so much that I've published research looking at compassion strictly. Uh, my, my research has been mostly on empathy, but it's, it's ever evolving more and more toward compassion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was, sounds like it was really the, the discovery of mirror neurons and a real interest in mirror neurons that, that sort of was the trigger that kind of set you, or the spark that set you off in this, in this path. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I tend to be one of those people that tends to go where I'm led <laughs> sometimes uh -huh. more than planning it out. And so, uh, so I just, I just, yeah, really liked the idea with empathy. And of course I, uh, as clearly as you do, I felt like it was a very socially important construct. And, uh, and I've always been, uh, one of those people that just has this urge to, uh, to show other people stuff. And I'm, that's part of why I'm a teacher. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the more I've looked at empathy, uh, the more I've realized how much we could use it these days. And, uh, and so one of my overarching goals is to, to get a, a, a larger media voice. Uh, now exactly how I'm going to do that. I'm not sure, but ideally I would, uh, I'm working on a, on a trade book, you know, I, um, it's a little unfamiliar with this. I guess when we wrote this, uh, uh neuroscience of empathy, compassion and self-compassion, uh, I came to learn that, uh, that was a, uh, well, I don't know if they call it a technical text, but, uh, strangely enough, books that are written for the popular audiences, they tend to call trade books, I guess. Okay. Uh -huh. If you're familiar with that, at least that's what El what Elsevier told me. So, so I guess what I'm really interested in doing uh, is writing a trade book, a book uh, to be read by as many people as I can get to read. You know, because I, uh, I, I certainly believe that uh, empathy is extremely important, and I believe that the conditions that lead to empathy may not be as straightforward and obvious as many of us expect. Um, in particular, um, a real pet topic of mine uh, has always been, uh, at, uh, excuse me, uh, free will. The, the issue of whether free will exists or not um, anymore. I, uh, I just start with the, the belief that there just is no such thing as free will. It's in my view. It's an incoherent concept that, that just couldn't exist. Um, and so I don't really spend as a scientist, don't spend my time looking for evidence of free will existing or disproving that it exists. Uh, but rather uh, I look at uh, interested in the effects that believing in free will have on our treatment of one another. Uh -huh. And, uh, and perhaps surprisingly, I think counterintuitively for a lot of people, uh, it's, it's my theory or hypothesis that, uh, believing someone has free will tends to make us less compassionate toward that person. Whereas disbelieving in free will makes us better empathizers. Um, you know, take for example, uh, a murderer, right? Someone who's murdered another individual. If, if I believe that person, that murderer, at the last moment before he reached out and strangled the, uh, the, the victim, if I believe that he could have at that very last moment chosen, okay, you know what? Yes, I've got all these genes driving me to kill this, but I've got emotional uh, 
uh, very emotional right now and my upbringing was kind of rough, you know, maybe you got all these kind of causes, but ultimately free will says that none of that can cause you to be a murderer, that ultimately you can make the choice, uh, at least at that very final second, you can make that choice to not murder. And if that's the case, then, then I'm pretty upset with the murderer. Uh, I mean, like, come on, you didn't have to do this. If I had been in these exact same circumstances you were in, I would not have murdered. I would have made the choice not to. That's if I believe in free will. If on the other hand, I believe, uh, actually, I don't know if you can see it on the whiteboard up there, it says all mental events are the inevitable consequences of antecedent causes. You know, this is, this is basically just determinism. And, and it's, it, it appears to me that if I believe you as a murderer, as, it's not a matter that you just made the wrong choice, but rather you have uh, the control mechanism, you know, the self-control mechanism in your brain, as often turns out to be the case with, with folks like murderers, that control mechanism is hypoactive, it's underactive. That thing that in you and I, I mean, we've all had the re urge to reach out and strangle or do harm to someone in the past, but folks like you and I, I think we didn't do that. Why didn't we do it? Because this self-control region was able to inhibit the motor system so that the hands didn't actually reach out. And we had the thought, but we didn't act on it. Um, in, in folks with uh, antisocial personality disorder, as, as often tends to be the case with people who murder, they, that self-control region is underactive. And so their motor system is not inhibited in the same way yours. They may have the exact same belief that, hey, it's wrong to kill another person, or maybe I'm worried about going to prison, but that belief can't activate enough inhibition in their motor system. Therefore, they go ahead and execute the action. And, and so modeling it that way, instead of uh, saying that it was as a matter of free choice, but modeling it as an inevitable consequence of antecedent causes, I suddenly have great sympathy. I feel bad. I'm sorry for this murderer, right? I'm, I'm sorry that he murdered, and I'm very sorry for his victim, of course, and the family and friends and, and all that. I mean, that's as horrible as always. But disbelieving in free will actually allows me to empathize with the murderer himself. Mm -hmm. And now I've got a chance of, uh, of maybe helping this person, or you know, the more I can understand what conditions lead to such murders, the better. Uh, as a society, we can intervene and kind of keep those conditions from happening as often. Would it, be, would it be sort of the, uh, <laughs> if you believe in free will, you're, you're kind of more prone to judgment. So you're going to be, exactly. you're going to face the person with a judging attitude. So instead of trying to really understand their, their dynamics, their experience, why they're doing what they're doing, which then gives the information for designing, you know, alternative, you know, approaches to head that mm -hmm. off from happening. You just uh, judge them and then you want to go do punitive action or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. If, uh, if I believe they have free will, it doesn't really matter what all those conditions were because ultimately you should be able to use your free will to stop yourself from doing that action. But if free will doesn't exist, then doing that action is solely a function of the preceding causes. And, and if I believe you have free will, I can't, I can't really scientifically understand your decision process. I mean, science depends on determinism. And for the most part, uh, you know, A happens and that causes B. Well, free will says it can get in, in between the causes of your behavior and your behavior. And free will itself is free of causation. It cannot itself be. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the, the answer to why you murdered is in here, but because it's not a physical uh, deterministic system, I can't study it scientifically, which means I can never really understand how somebody makes a free choice to murder versus a free choice not to murder. Uh, there's, a, there's a book out by Simon Baron Cohen, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but it's about the, the science of evil. And his is the same thing as this, this whole notion of evil has that same uh, dynamic that you're describing. It, uh -huh. It's just this this existential essence and there's like you can't really study it because it's just supernatural or something so it mm. doesn't allow you to and he, he he's kind of translating it into instead of it being the word evil is it's it's uh, empathy erosion there's a, a lack of empathy and then once you start looking at the dynamics of empathy you can start designing uh for increasing the level of empathy uh mm. because so it sounds very similar. There's a similarity to, to that. I think that's of, right. And uh, in fact, I've been, I've been meaning to pick up a copy of uh, Baron Cohen's book. I, I definitely need to. In fact, uh, we asked him uh, to be an author of the book. 
chapter in this book, uh, but you know, he's, he's quite successful, very busy person. And, he yeah. just, and in fact, had his own book. <laughs> yeah. Write a, why write a chapter? But I, I think the, the, the critical thing there that it sounds like he and I would agree on is that, uh, is that if I believe there's just evil, uh, well, actually, let me, let me put this a different way. Uh, one of my favorite ideas is, is involves looking, uh, well, it deals with the idea that uh, we're in all, in every, every area of, of life, humans over, you know, thousands of years at least have been moving further and further away from supernatural explanations of things we observe and more and more toward natural scientific explanations. And uh, one of my favorite uh, analogies of this is I like to think of the ancient Egyptians, you know, say around 7,000 BC or somewhere like that. And, um, and these folks, you know, they believed in the sun god Ra. And, and if you think about it, you can, you can really understand, you can do a little perspective taking, you can see exactly why they believed the sun was a god. You know, you look at it, you, you go blind. Uh, if it goes away for a long period of time, crops die, maybe even people start to die. It's, it's up there in a realm that I climb to the top of the highest pyramid and I don't get any closer to it. I throw a rock at it and it doesn't seem to get anywhere near it. It's, it's you know, it's got to be supernatural. Well, today, there, there are many reasons not many folks today think of the sun as a god. But I would argue one of the primary reasons is because the physical theory, the natural theory of the sun just works so much better than the supernatural theory. If I want to be, build solar panels, the sun god theory of Ra is probably not going to get me there. You know, uh, however, the, you know, that supernatural theory, the natural theory, though, of, of uh, the sun being a ball of hydrogen fusing into helium, et cetera, you know, uh, that is something that will actually get me to building solar panels or sending satellites into orbit. And, um, and I believe we're on a similar transition now with the mind. It's such a bizarre thing. It's hard to understand as ordinary matter, an ordinary physical event. It's only made sense to us up till now to think of the mind as a supernatural phenomenon. And of course, supernatural phenomena are not bound by the laws of physics. Therefore, supernatural soul could have free will. Uh, however, the psychological sciences, as you see in the name of our department, you know, we're we're determined that we can study the mind scientifically, which means we're assuming it's not a supernatural phenomenon, but a natural one. And as such, I can understand, theoretically, I could understand all the causal antecedents to any given brain state. One of those, in my case, being empathy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I suspect if we believe in free will, then we believe that something non-physical explains why you did what you did, but I can't understand that non-physical thing. Uh, if, in fact, though, the mind really is just a natural physical phenomenon, then it has any, anything the mind does at any given moment was the inevitable consequence of preceding causes. Now I can understand why the murderer murdered by going back and looking at those antecedent causes. A having said that, of course, the mind is extremely complicated and the number of causal variables that impinge on the mind at any given moment are enormous which is why we have to have a science to do it. Otherwise, we could just kind of intuit each other's reasons for behaving the way we do. But, uh, but it's tough. It's tough to figure out all the causal antecedents, but science, you know, the natural explanation is the one that's going to be able to do it. The supernatural explanation has done as much for understanding the mind or the soul as I believe it can do. And it's now slowly giving way to the physical explanation. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it uh, more practical. You're saying the scientific method has a practicality to it, and you can right. really use your yeah. insights to have some kind of uh, some kind of an effect. And uh, the approach, the angle I'm coming at it from, is that we need to create a, a culture of empathy. So sort of redesign the society to uh, foster more of this empathic understanding. So the person that you're talking about that commits the uh, the murder that you can understand that person, but you can also, we can also be teaching and training and creating a society that that person uh, learn those skills to have the support to have more of an empathic way of being because they, they didn't, when they commit uh, a murder, they're, they're not empathizing with the, the needs and the feelings and experience and the well-being of the person that they murdered, you know, because mm -hmm. they didn't have a voice or, you know, I mean, they're, right. they're in a fight or so it is good to understand, you know, all the how how this how empathy works. Because then we can de design systems and a culture yeah. that's more supportive uh, of this value, which that's I think is really critical in how we um, relate to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, uh, you're probably familiar with Steven Pinker mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, Better Better Angels of Our Nature. That book, uh, 
that really did a lot for me. Um, you know, he points out uh, the that it was the invention of the printing press, right? That he believes may have been one of the most important inventions in human history that make us a less violent people. You know, I, I love how he starts his book out. It I, I'm kind of paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote, but he starts with a statement, something to the effect of, "Believe it or not." And I know most of you will not. Humans are enjoying the least violent time in their history. And I love that because he says, believe it or not, and I know most of you won't, because yeah, most of us, we, are you kidding me? This, we're horribly violent now. We're just such a, we're so much more violent than we used to be. Uh, but it, in fact, uh, Pinker makes a great argument that pretty much throughout recorded human history, you can find evidence that we've gotten less and less violent with one another. And again, the printing press, the whole idea was that the printing press enabled uh, the advent of novels, mass dist distributed novels, stories about, you know, usually fictional characters, right? But, uh, but after that point, the printing press, for the first time in human history, lots of people started learning to read because they, they could actually get access to a book. And, uh, and they would often start reading novels, which required them to empathize, right? Um, you know, the, the way to, to really get involved in a novel is to empathize with, say, the protagonist or, or whomever. And uh, before novels, most humans were not practicing empathy on that level or perspective taking on that level. After novels became around, now people could just sit there and read, which meant they were spending time, oftentimes every day, spending time practicing how to empathize with, again, in this case, fictional characters, but these fictional characters are usually somewhat similar, at least to real characters. And so his idea is that we've just gotten, thanks to media in general, we are getting better and better at understanding what the world looks like through other people's eyes. And the more I understand what the world looks like through your eyes, the less able I am to harm you. Well, there's a lot of threads we can follow here. I did want to be sure to get the table of con go through the oh, table yeah, of right. contents of your book to for is that so this would be a bit of an introduction to the book and people would know you know to uh, what to expect and uh, the different topics. Uh, see, <laughs> it sounds like we're going to need a couple of uh, discussions about these. You know, the all the round. There's a huge amount. I mean, it's really yeah. a huge amount uh, in this book so uh well and ironically what i was just talking about really isn't in the book so it isn't what isn't in the book so let's cover what's in the book and maybe we'll have to schedule some more uh discussions okay. that go into some of the details but at least let's get the outline uh so that you have uh you can go to the chapters and see how many chapters do you have here it's 11 chapters and yeah. you have different authors for each chapter and Chapter number one is called, What is this feeling that I have for myself and for others? Contemporary perspectives on empathy, compassion, self-compassion, and their absence. And this, is, uh, this chapter is written by you and Larry Stevens, your co-editor. Mm -hmm. So what's kind of in a nutshell, what, what is this uh, chapter about? Uh, yeah, well, obviously it's an introductory chapter. So we're trying to just kind of introduce some of the topics that are gonna be addressed in subsequent chapters. and. Uh, um, one of the things we grapple with, or, or at least we try to point out uh, definitional problems, mm -hmm. just about any area of psychology has definitional problems, right? I mean, you, you just take something as obvious as memory, right? And we discovered uh, over time, we just go, well, there's not just a such thing as memory. There are many different types of memory. And, you know, so, uh, so defining exactly what we're talking about has been an issue. So, so, for instance, what's the difference between empathy and compassion? And, uh, and it seems kind of obvious, I think, intuitively, but then when you start to break it down, well, it's not so clear. And, uh, you know, where does empathy begin or end and compassion begin, or, or is it the other way, or is it compassion first and then empathy? Um, and, uh, and, and the real thing we get into is, does, you know, one thing is we're asking in the chapter one as well, is it the case that empathy is necessarily pro-social? And again, this define, depends on how you define it. Yeah. I tend to think of it as not necessarily pro-social. It certainly is a great tool to promote sociality, but uh, but I'm I'm of the opinion that empathy is also the kind of thing that um, that a sadist might be engaged in. So if if I derive pleasure from causing you pain, I have to be able to empathize with that pain. Is at least the way I think of empathy. Some people say, well, no, empathy you can't empathize. Uh, you can enjoy somebody else's pain and call it empathy, but as far as I can tell, yeah, that's still empathy because in order for me to receive the reward as the sadist, I have to understand what you're going through. 
if you're going through a bunch of pain and misery, but I, I think you're just laughing, I misunderstand your feelings, then I don't get that sense of reward. So, so the way I tend to define empathy tends to include uh, some negative social consequences as well. Um, but uh, but yeah. just step in here. So the, the, the whole area of definition is, is with empathy, like, like you're saying with, with all the other terms, it's like at the surface it looks kind of obvious, but you start digging into the into the nuances, and it seems like every word starts getting very nebulous in terms of the. Uh, and uh, the same thing is true with empathy. It does seem to create a lot of of confusion about what the heck are we talking about. Um, mm -hmm. For example, the book you know uh, Against Empathy by Paul Bloom. Mm -hmm. It's like he, you know, I could never, I couldn't understand what he was talking about. And then when I really saw that he was talking about what I would call sympathy or, or emotional mm -hmm. contagion in the sense mm -hmm. that, that for me, empathy is feeling into your experience. So right now I saw you shaking your head. You know, my mirror neurons were kind of registering. You know, I'm also feeling what does it feel like to shake your head? That that means mm -hmm. an agreement. I'm getting a sense of understanding, a sense of resonance, you know, with what I said. And so it's me feeling into your experience is what I consider one kind of a basic form of, of empathy. And for him, it's like if you are angry, like you're jumping up and down, totally angry, that he's calling empathy that I jump up and down being totally angry. So we're both jumping up and down being totally angry. And for me, that's actually a block to empathy because I'm no longer present with you you know, following your, your experience, I'm like off in my own world of uh, sympathizing with you or whatever, which actually detracts from me feeling into you. So uh, a therapist, for example, or, or a friend would say, oh, I'm hearing you're feeling angry. And you say, yeah, I'm angry because, and you kind of open up the experience, and you go deeper and feel into that experience. And so that's kind of what I'm calling empathy. And then there's the mutual empathy that we do it for each other mm -hmm. and are, are, you know, sort of empathic for the state of the, re the relation, the feelings of the relationship. So it, it's quite a, it's, it's one of the biggest stumbling blocks, it seems, to this mm -hmm. area. It's just the different understandings, so the different aspects that we're talking about. It's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you and I agree quite a bit on what we call empathy and, and that you and I kind of disagree with, uh, with Bloom on that. Um, and, and, and here's where I would say, you know, is, is Bloom right? Are we right? And I would say, well, it really just depends on what we agree is the definition of an empathy. empathy yeah. The problem is right now, you and I don't agree with folks like Bloom. There's plenty of folks like Bloom, uh, uh, a researcher, uh, uh, there's Tanya Singer in Germany. Tanya Singer too, that's a nightmare, her work, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, and so, they consider that, like you said, emotional distress or personal distress. Uh, they consider that empathy too. And, and for me, I choose to make a key uh, component of empathy be the focus of attention. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm empathizing with you, that means my attention is focused on you. My thoughts are about you. On the other hand, if, if like in your example, you suddenly get angry and then I start acting angry, well, you know, if I'm angry, my, my autonomic fight or flight response is going to kick in. And, and of course, fight or flight is all about survival. And survival is all about focusing on the self. Right. We're, we're programmed. We're genetically evolved to, if we're in threat, we bring all, everything to the self and figure out how to, to save ourselves. So if I watch you getting angry or upset, and that makes me angry or upset, then I can't focus my attention on you because my physiology is driving it toward myself. Again, Singer and Bloom, as far as I can tell, would argue, no, that's still empathy. I tend to say, no, empathy happens only in those instances where I can maintain my focus attention on you. If it yeah. gets shifted, the more it gets shifted to myself, the less I would call it empathy. And yeah, the, the thing is with what uh, Paul Bloom is saying, it, it even gets more complicated because it's, that it probably started with an empathy as we would describe it, right? Mm -hmm. The person who's sees the other person get angry is feeling into that, but then they're having a reaction that they're going into. So they're, they, they're doing both. They're doing both an empathetic yeah. and probably shifting to be part or wholly in terms of 
mm -hmm. of uh, the self-oriented, you know, distress or whatever, sympathy or whatever it is. So there's all these little nuances like that in, on top of it, too. Mm. Well, and, and just a just a foreshadow for whenever we get to, to chapter 11, uh, I put in a, a model I put together, uh, called it the empathy to compassion model. Uh, so, you know, where's empathy, where's compassion relevant? Well, I just try to uh, model the, the situation, those situations where we understand another person's uh, plight and then we feel compassion for them. And, and, and I just model it as the focus of attention where we start out with, uh, I, I, I suspect we start, yes, that, that was, was, is that the one? That's exactly it, right. And yeah, that, I, I read that really resonated. I thought it was a great, that's why I even bookmarked it. Oh, great, great, glad to hear that. Yeah, and so that's kind of how I think of, of empathy is to determine whether I'm at any given instant, am I empathizing? The question is, where is the focus of my attention? Yeah, and also I would say in terms of what the, the negative aspects of, of, of empathy that you're talking about, I see that as very similar that sort of the, the psycho, not the, the, the person who's taking advantage of someone, the, the uh, schadenfreude or what have you, that mm -hmm. they're empathizing with the person but then the, uh, the self-focus of schadenfreude I mean, or power over, there's sort of a feeling into someone's experience. Mm -hmm. And then you hear someone taking advantage of the insights that they learn. But the taking advantage of the insights or is, is sort of a power over, like a narcissist trying to have power over the person. So again, we're talking, it's, it's not just you're empathetic or narcissistic or, I mean, uh, psychopathic that there's sort of this constant in interplay between these dynamics and the part of being the psychopath is that sort of the negativity that you're talking about. I don't consider that is empathic, that aspect of, that it's a power, usually a kind of a power over that's mm -hmm. like you're using the information you gain through the empathic connection and it, then you're trying to like suppress or do something over that person. So that's just kind of another yeah, actually, I would agree with that. It's a, it's a great distinction uh, for, for the sadist, as I said a minute ago. I guess it's not that their sadism is empathy, but rather empathy helps them get to sadism. Yeah, uh -huh, exactly. Yeah. And so when they shift into their sadism, though, that that is uh, a lack of empathy at that mm -hmm. point. That becomes, so about, that becomes about their about own them, own Exactly. Own. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, those are some really so nuances. So I think that this chapter is like a whole interview <laughs> of its own. So maybe we'll continue on to the next one. This is great. I just love the, the kind of the nuances and the thinking, your thinking process here. The, yeah. so the number two is the brain that makes us concerned uh, for others towards the neuroscience of empathy. And that was Vera Flashback, uh, Christina Gonzalez. Lienzers? Um, yeah, I think it's Lienkreis. Lienkreis and Martin Brune. Yes. It looks like they're German, maybe. Yeah, here. Mm -hmm. yeah and Martin Brune is the one I've actually uh, actually met. I uh, actually visited his lab uh, a couple years back, and, and at that point I asked him if he'd be willing to write the book. But he does work somewhat similar to me in terms of using EEG uh, to look at things like uh, what – so I guess there's an important point, as I mentioned. I, I get very – hesitant or tentative when I start talking about using EEG to measure mirror neurons. We, we measure a signal we call mu suppression, Greek letter mu, but, uh, but it's, it's extremely open controversy about whether this signal really is tapping into mirror neurons. So, so I, I, I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that I'm saying mu suppression reflects mirror neurons. I, I, at best I'd give it a 50-50 toss up at the moment. Uh, I do believe that mu suppression is measuring some sort of brain activity related to empathy. So, uh, but I just don't know if it's mirror neurons. Uh, but yeah, uh, Martin Brun uses these things, uh, his muse suppression, to look at, um, at how empathy works in the brain. And he, he also, un unlike me, he's also a clinical psychologist. I don't really have any clinical. Oh, uh -huh. Not cool. but, uh, uh -huh. So he's, worked, he's even looked at this muse suppression in folks with borderline personality disorder and so forth. So Could you explain muse suppression? I'm not familiar with that term. It's a. Uh, uh, sure. uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so it's like the Greek letter mu, which. Uh, okay. uh -huh. The Greek letter, and it's uh, it's a it's an oscillation. It's a sine wave of you know you hear brain waves, right? Well, it's a brain wave that's coming from right over here over the motor system, where mirror neurons were first discovered. Um, the thing is with the EEG, I really I can see that the activity is right here on the scalp, 
But where it's coming from in the brain is extremely difficult to figure out. Not impossible, but extremely difficult, such that folks like researchers like myself, we never even bother localizing where the activity is coming from. Um, uh, so uh, I believe it's coming uh, from your neuron activity, but I can't really be certain. Um, but, but yeah, it's just a signal from the EEG that uh, most, has been most closely associated with mirror neurons, but the jury's still out on just to what extent that signal really reflects mirror neurons. But to drive the point home further, in a sense, I'm not really invested in whether this mu suppression signal really does represent mirror neurons, simply because I do know that it represents empathic processing of some sort, even mm -hmm. if it's not neuron empathic processing. So I like it for that reason, it's for, because it's empathy, but, uh, but to do, uh, refer to it as a mirror neuron measure. Okay. Even though the conservative scientists in me will say, okay, well, it's, it's an open question. And this is a, a lab in, in Germany, all three of them are at this lab where they're studying? Oh, they, they, they were, yeah. Uh, Martin Brune and is, is, uh, he's a professor at uh, Bochum University in, uh, Ruhr, you know, I'm not even sure how to say it, Ruhr, R-U-H-R. Uh, Ruhr. Uh, it's in the Westphalia region uh -huh. of, of Germany. And uh, these other two were, I think, a graduate student and a postdoc. Um, and the postdoc was this uh, Gonzalez Lincieras or Lincris, uh, can I can't remember. And, and as far as I recall, she is now at the University of Barcelona. And first author, I'm not sure if she's still in, in Dr. Brune's lab or has moved on. So. Okay, then, uh, then we have chapter three, the brain that longs to help others, the current neuroscience of compassion. That's your colleague Larry Stevens and Jasmine Benj Benjamin yep and what is that chapter about uh, so that's really just uh, going into a little bit of the definitional definitional stuff of compassion you know, what is compassion uh, and what kind of situations promote it versus demote it and then uh, just going into what is uh, what is the best knowledge we have about brain processes that contribute to uh, to compassion of course as you would suspect you know, neuroscience is really very much in its infancy, so we've got a heck of a lot to learn, which I, I call that job security. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, so we're going in, or Larry anyway, uh, is going into that chapter, just uh, giving the latest and greatest on what kind of brain processes appear to relate to it, to compassion. And, uh, and I'll mention his, uh, his co-author on that one, Jasmine Benjamin, uh, was actually uh, an undergraduate at the time that she helped write that. And I think that's really quite to her credit. This is a, she did a quite a good job for an undergraduate. I would, when he told me he was going to bring an undergraduate in on his chapter. Like, oh yeah. Look, I don't know if that's going to reach the level, uh, but, but she, uh, she and Larry together, I think put together a great chapter. Um, well, yeah. It's interesting. The whole uh, empathy and compassion, there seems to be different threads. Like the empathy work that I've seen comes from like the work of Carl Rogers in the clinical, like you're talking about mm -hmm. the cl being a clinician in the therapeutic clinical thread. There seems to be a thread in terms of uh, the neuroscience now, you know, mirror neurons. And then also from the design community, human centered design using empathy to uh, design any product. The idea is that if you design anything, you need to understand what the uh, effect will be on the felt experience of people. You know, will this be a positive experience using this product? And so they're very interested. Whereas the, the compassion work, the thread seems to come from the religious community. And then uh, especially mo more recently from Buddhism, you know, Dalai Lama had done so many talks around the country that a lot of people and came into it from from those that thread so those are just some different influences i'm seeing kind of different communities and they sort yeah. of bring in sort of you know material from from the diff, from those different communities is that do you have you seen that or like larry what's his sort of background for example? yeah well actually uh larry larry's uh larry's been meditating i think for at least 20 uh -huh. years also he's a uh, i don't i don't think he would call himself a buddhist but he's certainly a quite familiar with some of the Buddhist philosophy and and it really is striking of of all the religions I'm aware of by far Buddhism has the most to talk to science about um, you know so so with the idea of compassion uh, a lot of stuff that I feel like compassion researchers today are quote-unquote discovering really do seem to have been foreshadowed uh, by Buddhism you know on the order of two to three thousand years ago you know so uh, there really is to me a, a surprising and intriguing amount of insight that that particular religion, if we call it that, uh, has generated. 
you know, by comparison, somebody like myself who, uh, you know, as a youth and into early adulthood grew up as a Christian, uh, I now as a scientist looking back, I don't, I don't see so much at all in my practice of Christianity that, I, oh yes, that's related to what I'm studying here scientifically. Mm -hmm. So, but, but yeah, when it comes to Buddhism, one thing is, uh, and I'm not anywhere near an expert on Buddhism, but I understand that, that most uh, forms of Buddhism don't really spend time talking about a supernatural world to where the supernatural soul will one day go. Uh, instead, they seem to focus on the here and now, and that, I think, lends itself more to science. You know, if, if I'm talking about heaven, I, I consider that a supernatural phenomenon, if it exists at all. And because it's supernatural, I'll never be able to understand it in any kind of scientific way. Uh, and, and to me, anymore in my life, that means that super, supernatural explanations, I believe, hold no, of, no value mm -hmm. at all. Plenty of people just disagree, so I don't, don't mean to gloss over that. But for me, a supernatural, I, uh, a supernatural claim is one that cannot be tested or evaluated. Therefore, I don't know if it's right or wrong or anywhere in between. Natural claims can be tested scientifically. And, and again, many of the claims that Buddhism makes seem to be of a more natural mm -hmm. variety, supernatural. Um, so yes, absolutely. I would say particularly Buddhism, uh, there's a lot of uh, influence in the science of compassion these days. Uh, certainly religions I grew up, you know, the Christian Protestant religion I grew up with, uh, we certainly talked about compassion, but I frankly would argue that while it does, you know, many forms of Christian religion do promote compassion, I think they at least as much can uh, promote the opposite of compassion. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, you know, our religious beliefs can lead us to treat do unto others as we would do unto ourselves, but oftentimes it can lead us to, you know, to really hurt others in a way that we would never do to ourselves. So, uh, so well, I, I don't from the Christian, I find yeah, I, I come from that same evangelical, you know, Christian uh, background. I know that you know Carl Rogers came from that background too. Uh, if you're so, uh, there's something about him, but. I need to read Carl Rogers. Yeah, definitely, because he's, he's from the whole clinical, he was very, he combined the clinical experience with the scientific. So he really tried to merge the two. So what really works, you know, what is really working as well as kind of explaining sort of the, the dynamics of what's going, coming up with some theories uh, as well. So that's kind of like the thread that I think is kind of the core for me is that that uh, Carl Rogers, um, kind of that humanistic sort of psychology, you know, yeah. aspect. So, okay, then just uh, want to be sure we get it, all these chapters. Chapter four, the brain that longs to help itself, the current neuroscience of self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And that was and Larry again and Mark uh, Gauthier Brahman. Brahman. Gauthier Brahman. Gauthier Brahman. Yep, and uh, right, and so this chapter, uh, this was, this was, you know, I mentioned earlier we were hoping to get Baron Cohen to write that uh, cruelty chapter, but he was too busy. Here we were hoping to get uh, Krista Neff. I don't know if you. Uh, I have interviewed her a couple times, uh, okay, several great. times yeah. actually. Uh -huh. that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, uh, and, and she was going to write it, but then uh, at the last minute she wound up uh, a little over overbooked, and uh, and and of course she's uh, of anybody in the sciences, she's the one that seems to have. Well, I mean. Uh, I mean, I guess as far as I can tell, she, I don't know if she, did she coin the term self-compassion? Uh, she's certainly one of the original. Uh, really popularized it, yeah. Certainly, yeah. And, um, and, and so this is interesting. You know, the, uh, Larry Stevens and I had just a minor disagreement about the title of the book, The, the Neuroscience of Empathy, Compassion, and Self-Compassion. I wanted to call it just The Neuroscience of Empathy and Compassion, and then have self-compassion be a chapter in there. Um, but to Larry's thinking, Self-compassion is not just simply compassion toward the self. Um, he seems to, to believe that it really is kind of its own construct in and of itself. Um, and and, and I, I'm not fully versed in that argument, so I, I wouldn't really try and put that forth. But that's uh, the, the gist of this uh, chapter, I think, is, is this, this construct of self-compassion. It's not just being nice to the self, but having a, a completely different conception of oneself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, it's a non-judgmental. It's, it's one, I mean, as I understand the construct, there's kind of three components. I just remember one is seeing everyone's common humanity. The other is, um, not even forgetting, it's like not having self-judgment. So, you know, accepting right, oneself. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, I just see her uh, speak at one at a conference one time, and and it was really poignant to me. She, you know, she was mentioning, look, you should be nicer to yourself. You should be more compassionate to yourself, even when you fail. You know, and I remember thinking, well, if I did that, I'd I'd never get anything done. You know, uh, she, in other words, she says like a. So think about when a friend fails at something. What do you say? Oh, it's all right. Get up, shake your boots. You'll do it. You'll get them next time. You know. But of course, for most of us, when it comes to our own failures, idiot, why, why didn't you try harder? You know. And, and I certainly just assumed that if I treated myself like I treated my friends, that I'd never get anything done. Mm-hmm. Um, it's okay. You have to kind of push really yourself. Uh-huh. Yeah. But yeah, her research suggests that, you know what, you actually get more done if you are nice to yourself. You know, that people who are self-compassionate are more productive than folks that are hard on themselves. And that's, you know, psychology so often has dark things to tell us about ourselves, you know, Milgram shock experiments and will really hurt. But uh, the self-compassion thing is quite positive. It, it turns out that, hey, you'll enjoy life more and do be the person you want more if you're nice to yourself rather than beating yourself up when you fail. Well, for me, I come at this from, I mean, there's that, that empathic approach where with, with, a, with a, this sort of was articulated by Carl Rogers in the therapeutic world that when people are suffering, have difficulty, or just in general, that it's, it's very helpful. It's very supportive as human beings just to be heard, you know, mm-hmm. when you're just heard. And his, one of his main core uh, processes was just the reflective listening, active listening, like hearing someone and just following along with them. He says, it's like, you don't try to steer people. You don't try to, you Uh just go and follow them in their own thought process, their own experience, their own feeling process. And just that, being able to share that and someone else being with you in that process is, it feels very good. It supports creativity and, Uh you know, new kind of forward movement happens there. So that's kind of how I'm sort of looking at empathy. And then what I'm looking at is the culture of empathy, where it's not just like the therapeutic world. It's just one person listening to the other, and that's the end of it. The person that's being heard is not learning the part of listening to the other person. So they're only learning the empathy of receiving that attention. They're not learning the aspect of sort of offering the attention to the other and so I'm looking at like a mutual empathic culture where we listen to each other and you mm-hmm. itself get also uh, heard and seen. Yeah. So from that, that's in the empathy tent, right? I, I that's just, what the empathy tent is. We go out yeah. there and we listen to all sides. Doesn't matter what, where you on the political spectrum. We listen yeah. to you and we bring people together to dialogue with each other. It, you it think. like you have the listener reflect back what they heard so that the one who spoke it can say, yes, okay, you actually heard me. Until you feel fully heard. We'll argue uh-huh. with each other when we're not actually hearing what each other's saying. And, and exactly, this yeah. Kind of guarantees that, okay, yep, they heard me. Now let's see if they agree with it. Yeah, but you, and you don't have to agree with what right, the right. person says, but you keep the dialogue going enough that the empathy is like an integrative process. It's taking mm-hmm. two different, you know, neural networks and meshing. It's kind of, it helps to integrate those neural networks and that for me that's what kind of empathy is is that integration and can we create a culture that supports this kind of integration between people and that's what the empathy circle is is like a simple process that you know the most basic sense kind of uh, helps do that integration and just wanted i was kind of getting to the self-compassion that within the empathy community there is also the concept of self-empathy So I can also, which is maybe overlaps a little bit with mindfulness, that I can feel into my own experience. So what am I feeling? I can feel that. I can acknowledge that. And when I do that, it kind of dissipates and something else arises. And then something else arises. So it's very similar. And in fact, uh, when when you're heard by somebody else, they are supporting you in your own self-empathy. Mm. You're feeling, you're not only feeling into that person, you're supporting them and feeling into themselves. So that's, so you, the book could have been empathy, you know, compassion, self-compassion, and self-empathy. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's what I, that's the thing, that's what I was trying to get to because there is, you know, so that, that, anyway, that's, I don't know how that resonates, but that's kind of how, how I'm kind of like modeling it the, in, in my brain here yeah that makes sense to me okay 
So let's see the uh, next thing. I guess you need. To, how are you on time? Can we go over a little bit? Then oh, yeah, however. I, I, Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, great. If it's nice, you had a hard stop. Because we're only on chapter 5 of, <laughs> of 11. So chapter 5 is sometimes you get so mad I could, and then the neuroscience of cruelty and Taylor by Taylor West, Leah Saver, Savory, Robert Goodwin. Man, I'm really bad at pronouncing names. Sorry about no, that's that. fine. No worries. Yeah, uh, and and Robert Goodman is the uh, is the is a colleague here in psychological sciences department. Uh, Taylor and Leo were graduate students of his, and uh, and yeah, they uh, just work worked uh, at explaining you know kind of what what is cruelty, obviously the defining question, um, and then you know kind of distinctions between anger, aggression, and hatred, um, and you know there, there really isn't a whole lot of uh, neuroscience in this area. At the moment, so uh, well. In fact, that was the same thing was true for self compassion. That was one of the challenges for Larry Stevens writing that chapter. Is it was more taking you know the self compassion chapter was more about taking what we know about brain activity and theorizing how self, that might relate to self compassion. Simply because there's not much empirical research at the moment on the neuroscience of self compassion, uh, and so it, that's somewhat true with cruelty. Although I'd say there's more research on uh, in neuroscience on cruelty than there has been on self compassion. Um, and yeah, and they get in there listing uh, lots of disorders. You you were mentioning uh, narcissism earlier, and they distinguish that from Machiavellianism and uh, a couple other issues. So um, so yeah, I think that whole chapter is about uh, what is the relationship of empathy and compassion to cruelty. Again, compassion would have to be something roughly opposite of cruelty. I don't think anybody could say you know beating somebody over the head because you're angry or whatever. You would never call that compassion. Is the person's beating the other over the head using any empathy? Well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but that's uh, that's kind of where we're going. There is trying to figure out what, how does compassion and empathy relate to uh, to cruelty? And then, yeah, like you mentioned, Baron Cohen, that empathy erosion idea, uh, I'm I'm really quite fond of. Is is it's it's just the idea that there are certain conditions in which empathy gets promoted, like say an empathy tent, right? But then there are other conditions, like a like a mob. When we get involved in a mob, you know. Uh, you go through this de-individuation uh, where the the focus is not on one's individual self, but it's on the focus that the mob is focused on. Uh, and it's really quite interesting when we, um, when attention is shifted away from the self, uh, we tend not to act in accordance with our own morals well, right? A uh, really fascinating experiment, just simple so social psychology experiment where uh, it was Halloween night and they had in a the neighborhood, they had a bunch of houses that all had a bucket of candy sitting out in front with a sign saying, sorry, we had to leave at the last moment. Please just take one piece of candy. And of course there's a camera hidden back here and you're seeing and in, in most cases, kids took just giant handfuls. They didn't take just one piece, but some of the bowls had a mirror, just a simple mirror behind them. And in those bowls, people only took one piece of candy. So just simply seeing your own image will cause you to act more in accordance with your own moral beliefs. Mm. Mm -hmm. you can go up to that bucket and not be reminded much of yourself, then you don't feel as compelled to do the right thing as it were. Um, so I think that's a huge thing that's going on with cruelty is um, probably a lack of self-awareness and, and, and certainly a, a lack of understanding how one's cruelty is impacting the other. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. And how, how does that relate to empathy? Because like when we do the empathy tent where, We've been here at the battles of Berkeley, right? The right wing comes in, and then the you know the far left comes, like Antifa, and they battle it out. I mean, I mean, it's blood. I mean, it's, you just see people punching each other, they're throwing M80s at each other, they're spraying each other with pepper spray, and uh, you know all kinds of stuff. And so there's a real, you know, I mean, there's kind of like a cruelty there, wanting to kind of you know beat the heck out of the other uh, person and yeah, to really understand the relationship of empathy, how does how does this, you know, this cruelty kind of happen? So, mm -hmm. and how do we move move into that? So that's interesting. Okay, number chapter six. That's yours. Uh, reflections of others and of self: the mirror neuron system's relationship to empathy. Yeah. Uh, so, so this was just simply, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, or for, or mostly just a review of what we what we know and what we believe 
about mirror neurons right now. And uh, uh, I'm particularly proud of those when I'm in a row. But so it's, it, I think at the moment, it might still be the most current uh, review of the mirror neuron literature. <clears throat> Although it won't take long, you know, for somebody else to come and do another review. So, uh, uh, but, but right now, yeah, I, I spend uh, the first half of the chapter kind of talking about the discovery of mirror neurons and macaque monkeys and uh, subsequent research in mirror neurons and macaque monkeys. Uh, you, know, you may know uh, macaque monkeys are relatively small. They tend to be popular, common uh, participants. Uh, well, they're not participants, they're subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, and, and I will just give the caveat that while, while my research really probably wouldn't exist if this work hadn't been done in monkeys, I, I don't think that makes it right. <laughs> so, you know, hopefully Giacomo Zalati and colleagues don't, uh, don't watch this video. I don't, don't want to offend anybody there, but I definitely, I love knowing about mirror neurons, but I don't know that taking uh, an animal's life like a, a, a macaque monkeys is worth the knowledge that I get out of it. So, uh, so I do want to give that caveat there. Having said that, I'm, I, I just try to be comfortable with my own hypocrisy in saying that I, I don't do that kind of research myself, but the research I do, do is kind of made possible by that research. So, so I've got my hands a little bit dirty there and I just uh, try, to, try mm -hmm. to, I do very much uh, believe that, you know, these macaque monkeys are sentient, conscious feeling animals. And as such, I really don't like the idea of causing them harm, which, which the research does. But, uh, but yeah, it just goes through the discovery of mirror neurons in monkeys and then, uh, that was, you know, basically 1992, and so since then, Rizzolatti and his lab have continued uh, doing research and discovered quite a few interesting things about the properties of these mirror neurons. Um, for instance, maybe I'll say uh, one of them is that the mirror neurons they've looked at appear to be processing intentions, right? So, um, so if I read, you know, if I say wave hello to you, that started with the intention in my head to greet you. Right, and of course, what happens with mirror neurons is it means the same neurons in your head, head, sorry, in your head, those neurons that process your intention to wave to somebody, activated when you see me wave, um, and and therefore my intention has very rapidly creeped up in your head. Now, the interesting thing I, I find there is that I think my belief about the way this works is that moment you've got that intention to wave in your head your brain is treating it as your own intention. Yet, you don't necessarily wave back if you don't, you don't have to wave back, right? Uh, uh, if, because you've got what we call self-other differentiation, mm -hmm. right? You can recognize that, that you, Edwin, have in your head the intention to wave, not because you actually want to wave, but because you saw me carry out that intention. So uh, it, it's, it's really, it's kind of an interesting quandary. So it's great that we can, have each other's intentions activated in our heads so rapidly. That's great for social interaction, but you've got to be able to keep track in your head, which intentions really belong to me and which intentions belong to other people that I'm observing. Um, and so that's a little bit of what I go into here. Most of my looking at mirror neurons in the second half goes over the fMRI and the EEG research that we, and again, both with fMRI and EEG, we just kind of hope we're looking at mirror neurons, but we really don't know. Mm. It's difficult. Uh, strictly speaking, the only way to really know is to go inside the head and put an electrode in a single neuron. Uh -huh. Kind of uh, like they do it to macaque monkeys, that you can exactly. really kind of register the exact firing of them. Right. And, of course, kind of doing more just, uh -huh. what? and of course, nobody feels good about doing that yeah. unless it's during uh, surgery. And so there is one paper out there uh, had surgery and they recorded from single cells and, and, and indeed found that there are mirror neurons in humans. But again, if, when I'm recording that from the outside, it's really hard for me to know whether that's what I'm looking at or not. So I don't remember in this chapter, like there's this, this uh, uh, the mirror neurons came out, a lot of people kind of built on that. Then there were some criticisms of it, sort of discounting it. And then there was counters to the criticisms. And yeah. For example, Christian Kieser's, I don't know if he's, his yep. lab in, in Holland, uh, you know, he gave a response to the criticisms, just saying that the criticisms were kind of hyperbolic themselves. And the, right. the criticism was that the media is sort of making it a bit, bit hyperbolic uh, about the power, what's happening with mirror neurons. But then the criticisms were kind of doing the same thing. And uh, so I don't know, how, how did you, with the arc of what you're covering, was it kind of the yeah. criticisms too? I don't recall the, yeah, uh, I, yes, I, I do go into, let's, let me see. I certainly go into the debate about whether 
EEG and fMRI are measuring mirror neurons. And I think I also went into the debate about what are mirror, are they really even necessarily an actual thing? Um, and so I think there's a lot of legitimacy to the debate. Uh, you know, the very first paper I published on mu suppression, the title was, uh, well, it included the term the human mirror neuron system. And then I started reading some of this criticism. Okay, I, I need to back, you know, so I, I believe myself to be guilty with my first publication of just assuming that EEG mu suppression was mirror neuron activity. Uh, now I, I, I'm much more careful about it and I, I don't make those, those direct claims uh, and a lot of other people. So there are a, a few folks like Gregory Hickok in the field who said, all right, th this happens in every new field, right? You just mm -hmm. come right. Uh -huh. and everybody, oh, this is going to solve everything. And then we find out, okay, we thought it was everything. Well, it's just, this, it's still really interesting. It's not nearly exactly what everybody thought it was in the beginning. So I do think the conservatism that has, has come in uh, afterward is, is very badly needed, mm -hmm. um, even for folks like myself. And, uh, and so I think it's well warranted. Um, I, I would argue most of the folks that offer the criticism to the criticism are the folks coming from Giacomo Rizzolatti's lab. Right. Uh -huh. That teaser is one of those. Now that, now that's an ad hominem argument. I don't want to say they're wrong just because they, they want to be right. Uh, so I'm not saying that makes them wrong, but I do, I, I do wonder if they've got a bit motive, a bit of motivation to, to really oh, right. uh -huh. uh, beyond just pure philosophical scientific motivation. Yeah, the whole motivation thing, it's like this gets into my kind of just with uh, Tanya Singer, right? It's mm -hmm. like her work, it seemed to me it was highly motivated by the, the, the compassion community. Like, you know, being around the Dalai Lama, there's this whole group yeah. that kind of organized around the Dalai Lama. They've got a a torch to kind of, you know, carry. So it, it, you just see that, you know, science has all these other kind of motivations and, and so yeah. forth in it too. So. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe I could sum up what I was saying there, or at least what my belief is, is that um, I do believe uh, that there is a mirroring process in the brain. And I suspect that there are genuine mirror neurons. What I'm not convinced of is are these a special type of neuron? That is, they're kind of genetically programmed to be mirror neurons? Or are they like many of the other neurons in the brain, it's just where they're located gives them this mirroring property. So I don't know if a mirror neuron is something that exists in its own right, or no, uh -huh. one that is, does what it does by virtue of the way it's hooked up to the brain. Uh, either way, that would, that would be mirroring, so I'm not terribly invested in the answer to that question. But you're right, there are some people that try and go as far as arguing there's no evidence that mirror neurons are even actually a thing, that they actually exist. Um, and then one of the biggest debates on mirror neurons is to the extent they, that they reflect uh, action recognition or action under, does activation of that hand-waving neuron in your mirror neurons, does that equate to you understanding what hand-waving means? I suspect that no, because that's too simple, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Occam's razor in reverse, right? It's like, uh, Oftentimes, the simplest theory is just too simple. <laughs> um, and so I suspect that, well, mirror neurons are there and they're doing this mirroring, but I think, for one thing, you've got to bring other brain regions in that do that self-other different. If I don't understand that you intend to wave and that that's your intention, then I don't understand. You know, if, I, if I'm sitting here thinking it's my right. intention to wave, then I don't think I really understand the action. And, and those under the, the, uh, the self-other distinction, it has varying degrees of, you can kind of lose it, right? And that's even with Carl Rogers in his work, in his, he was describing empathy, was it is that self-other distinction. That was like way before, you know, mirror neuron. So he was already kind of aware. And then, you know, how do you have that distinction? A lot of, I've even talked to people who kind of get lost in the self-other distinction. If that kind of breaks down, they get totally lost in the who's feeling, are we talking about? And so... There's, there's a lot there to really explore and to articulate. That makes me think of, a, of, of an issue, actually. I'd be interested to know what your thought is. I, based on the way I tend to define empathy, I, I'm kind of led to the conclusion that the person in my life with whom I'm least able to empathize is my wife. The person that is closest to me, that is the, the more closely close a person is to you, uh, uh -huh. the less you can empathize because you know, when something happens to my wife, right, like it happens to me, I have a very hard time say, okay, that wasn't me. That was my wife, you know? Well, 
me is my wife to, to large. I think, I think maybe having that tight of a bond means my brain treats her body like it belongs to my brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've already kind of integrated the two and it's hard to kind of separate the exactly. two, the, yeah. the mindset. The, the main process I use is again, that Carl Rogers, the empathic listening. So within uh, relational therapy, relation, mm -hmm. not just therapy, but just in relation work, there's, using empathic listening between couples to kind of work out issues. And so that's like the core that we do in the empathy tent. We, we, we're doing that with the political left and right is that we get small groups of people together and, you know, one person shares in the empathy circle and they select who they're going to speak to and they share whatever is up for them. It can be what are concerns, fears, anxieties you have about in life. Or, and we did that at Politicon too. Mm -hmm. And they yeah, share it. They share it, and then the person that they're listening to reflects back their understanding of what the person says. So they're they're kind of taking the judgments out. They're taking the you know the the sympathy. They're taking all these sort of blocks to empathy, and they're just doing this empathic listening to reflect back until mm -hmm. the person who's speaking feels heard. Like you you know you kind of share something, you kind of run out of things to say, and then I say okay, I feel heard, and then it's the listener's turn to select who they want to speak to, and then that person reflects back what the, listen, the speaker is saying until they feel heard, and we go in that, in that, and that's kind of the core, that's like the first step of the, I mm -hmm. think for me, of the empathy, because you're really accompanying the person, following them in their journey of where they're going, and then you sort of get us this sort of a feeling resonance of you get deeper and deeper into the felt experience of the other person so uh, anyway that I, I would you know in terms of studying that i would love to see i talked to christian keezers like he's going to do an empathy circle with his staff oh okay i'm trying to encourage him to do some studies like the effectiveness of like an empathy circle like how effective is it because there's so much work being done on mindfulness because you know but there's very little on this empathic listening um, on, on, on uh, actually hearing uh, the other term. yeah that's yeah. actually interesting you know you could you could certainly compare brain activity uh under condition where that reflection is going on versus how much empathy uh do you get when that reflection is not incorporated yeah uh-huh so it'd be, it'd be pretty easy to sound like easier size so maybe we can talk about that later so yeah a, yeah, I don't know true. if you're going to continue on this in this direction, but yeah, let's just be sure we get through just for the time allotted the rest of the chapters here. So then chapter seven is why does it feel so good to care for others, but only sometimes for myself? And that was uh, Melissa Birkett and Joni uh, Sasaki. Sasaki. Yep. Yep. And uh, so Melissa Birkett, was a, up until this year, was a, a colleague here in our department. She is now at Southern Oregon University. And then Joni Sasaki was a, just a, a friend of hers through, uh, I think just through meeting at conferences and stuff. I forget where Sasaki is at, but uh, she's at a different university. And, uh, and yeah, the, uh, the, the main point of this one was, uh, was to go into the neuroendocrinology. Uh, you know, uh, so for me doing EEG research and then my colleague Larry Stevens also does EEG research. You know, you don't really look at, at the endocrine system uh, typically in that you can't really see it for one thing. So you can't measure, you know, EEG can't measure chemicals in the body, cortisol and adrenaline and stuff. Uh, and so, uh, so we, we reached out to Melissa for that since it's more of her expertise and, and, and she talks about stuff like uh, cortisol uh, or, well, she does talk about cortisol, but I was thinking more about oxytocin, right? Oxytocin has been called the love hormone, although, uh, although that's just way oversimplified, right? It turns out it doesn't simply make you closer to anyone around you. It makes you closer to people in your in-group, but can actually make you feel a little further from people in your out-group. So, so it's not a simply pro-social uh, hormone like we thought it was originally. We find that sometimes it's pro-social, but other times it can actually make you less social. Um, and that's the way everything works in, in, in the brain, right? You think it does one thing, but it turns out, no, it does one thing in one context, but a very different thing in another context. And, um, and so that's where she's going at. And uh, even, even a nice section in that book talking about the passing on of trauma across generations, uh -huh. right? So that uh, 
that the a mother that's traumatized uh, her treatment of her child her her pup and we're thinking of rats typically in these experiments the treatment of her pup uh, will be influenced by that which will actually cause a change in oxytocin levels and other hormones in um, in uh, the offspring's uh, physiology what can act which, so in other words like what I'm trying to get to is you've got mom you've got mom's offspring and then the offspring of that offspring that trauma that was experienced by mom can get carried all the way down to, you know, at least two generations later, um, which is, was a really important thing that I think is kind of a relatively new understanding, right? We're, we're realizing now, like take, take the uh, children on the border and uh, the separation uh, from the parents, you know, we're not just hurting, uh, we're not just hurting those children. We're going to hurt their children and maybe even the children of their children. Um, it's that trauma is not just, okay, well, these people, sorry for it, but you know, uh, you'll get over it eventually. No, that's going to last. It's going to mm. last decades. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons I'm actually interested in this em empathy work is uh, my parents were uh, Germans kind of on the eastern border. And, you know, when the Russians came in, uh, they mm. took revenge on everything that the Germans uh, had done to them. So oh. on my father's side, you know, everybody was uh, shot in his family except for him. And he was hiding at the at the time and on my mother it was uh you know those that for i think for like a week or two weeks that the russians were allowed to gang rape is freely to rape so it was like two million uh women or more were were raped uh, there so it's that kind of trauma that i just mm -hmm. you know I, my i was only born a couple of years after my folks uh moved to the united states so it for me it's like how do we head that trauma off and for me, it's like the empathy is, you know, we need a culture of empathy to heal the trauma as well as to head it off in the future. So, Well, you know, that's, that's a really important point. I think I've noticed folks in, in debating some folks more from, uh, from the conservative end of the spectrum compared to myself, political spectrum, that is, uh, talking about this, this children stuff. And, and of course, they're not in their everyday lives. They're not cruel people. They, most of them have children themselves and, and they're very good to those children. Uh, they they really do seem to have a genuine lack of understanding about why these people are even trying to come across the border, you know. And, and I, I know uh, some of them told me, you know, I would never, ever subject my child to that journey. That is horrible and dangerous, you know. And 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 clearly, what they're thinking is, well, these these you know lat Latin uh, parents, you know, must they must not be that compassionate toward their kid, must not care about it. it's like. And what I've tried to tell is, well, wait, but try to imagine, take you, your child, your love for your child, and your fierce protection of your child, and then imagine what would have to happen in the United States. What, you know, how much trauma would there have to be here for you to be willing to make that journey across the border that is so risky, you know? And, and I feel like that's what a lot of people that, that don't really sympathize with these folks, I feel like that's what they're missing is that, look, you would do the same thing if you had the exact same situation, mm. they, these people, I, and of course, I haven't met everyone that's coming across the border, so I can't really speak, but, but we do know that at least a lot of them are, they're trying to escape from situations where they fear they may die or otherwise just have really horrible lives. And, and I'm sitting here in the wealthiest country on the planet and thinking, well, why, why can't I afford to help these people? You know, the, well, you can't take care of the world's problem. Okay, but we could help. Yeah. <laughs> we can't can't take care of everybody but we can do as good a job as we can and maybe i shouldn't be impoverished because i'm helping others but but i won't be i could help others and really my poverty level won't change at all right i mean and in fact what we'll find i think i generally feel like if we if we could be more open that that everybody would actually be in, you know, in terms of poverty would be wealthier you know mm -hmm. um, yeah it's something an angle on that uh is that yeah it's like you can sort of feel sorry for people it that uh with the empathy tent and the empathy work we're doing it's like how do we bring people together from those countries uh with like say the conservatives or whoever so that there can be a dialogue between them so people can get to know each other yeah, so that's yeah. kind of like the first step like we can kind of argue with conservatives or can, or i'm I even sort of left the progressive movement. I'm now in the empathy movement where gotcha. I kind of see both sides as a bit dysfunctional, like a dysfunctional couple. And it's the empathy that can heal the, the, that, that, that lack of mutual understanding and the polarization. But in the same way that we can bring 
people from those different countries together and have dialogue and understand each other, as well as the solution is that we need a culture of empathy here in the United States. And if there's one thing we could export is a culture of empathy. So the people who are fleeing are leaving cultures that are like falling apart and do not have a culture of empathy themselves. So mm -hmm. it's sort of being, I don't, know, the, I don't know if it's evangelical or empathy, you know, it's like, how do we, you know, support proselytize into the yeah, proselytize. How do we support an empathic culture in Honduras or wherever those cultures are? Because it's not just money that's going to solve those problems. It's going to be a cultural transformation. It's hard to do when the United States itself is not exactly the best role model for that. So that's right. kind of how I'm kind of like, you know, approaching it that, that it is really the empathy itself that can be sort of the healing agent. And it's also the gateway that when people can start understanding each other, that then they can start finding solutions that work, you know, but mm -hmm. you got to have that, uh, be able to have the, you know, that, that connection, that understanding. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know how had a quick re response to that. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it, it does occur to me that, I mean, if you think about left, right kind of issues, uh, you know, I've just seen all the time people on both sides, at least some things they're saying are exactly the same, which is these people are idiots or these people are, or they yeah. don't, sheep following they're just sheep you know we're all saying those same thing well we can't both be right in that situation and it's probably not the case that either one of us is right in those cases you know uh and so i do feel like and you know how it works right you somebody does something you think is horrible typically if they if you give them a chance to explain why they did what they did you may still think it's horrible but you don't feel quite as much disdain for them mm -hmm. yeah you can't be as angry at somebody when you understand why they did the thing they did. You may still be angry, but not as angry. And, and that's really important. I mean, you look at the vitriol right now, right? And they, I really feel like there's gotta be some way for those two sides to recognize, first of all, we're not just being, you know, not just being selfish or this or that, or we're not just being, uh, I don't care about anybody. Uh, we, we have to get to that point, of, oh, okay, you really do believe what you're saying and there are reasons that you believe that. And yeah. I really, you know what I'm saying, there are reasons I believe that. That doesn't tell me who's right or who's wrong, if either one of us is right or wrong, but it does lower some of the animosity, I think, necessarily. And I, I feel like that's what you're trying to accomplish, yeah. that, right? Is, is yeah. once you recognize you're both actually hearing each other, you can't be as upset, and maybe that takes down some of the barrier to actually genuinely understanding one another. Yeah, and empathy is a core to that. That's what it seems is this aspect of empathy is core to that, that uh, understanding, so... Mm -hmm. uh, the benefits, one of the benefits of all the work that you're, you're doing. So then uh, chapter eight, uh, can we change our mind about caring for others? The neuroscience of systemic compassion training. Adam Calderon, uh, Todd Ahern, and Ahern. Uh, Thomas Krusinski. Krusinski, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and those, uh, <clears throat> so Adam, Adam Calderon was actually a student in that uh, NSF research experience for undergraduates program I was telling you about at the beginning that that kind of gave rise to this book um, And so he's a former student in that and then the other two are professors. He works with at uh, gosh Their universities escaping me right now somewhere back east um, <clears throat> But uh, but yeah, this is just looking into uh, to different ways to promote com compassion uh, I'm trying to this is one. I'm not remembering a heck of a lot about but um, but there certainly are those programs of course Kristen Neff has her own self-compassion training. Uh, so, uh, um, so yeah, I'm not sure I can think of much more to say on that okay. one. So it's just a training. How do you train yeah. compassion? Apply it in a type of uh, thing. And then chapter nine is also compassion training from an early Buddhist perspective, the neurology, the neurological concomitants of the uh, Oh, okay, so that's so coming from the Buddhist tradition, some training. Robert Goodman, Paul mm -hmm. Gwonski, mm -hmm. Gwonski yep. Leia Savory. Right, yeah, those so again, are coming from the Buddhist, again, that Buddhist compassion tradition. Yeah, yeah, those latter two uh, authors are were, were graduate students, and then Robert Goodman is a professor here at NAU and uh, in our department. And uh, his, his particular area is, is mindfulness. He's done all his research there, and he also uses electroencephalography to kind of look at uh, at how mindfulness is working. But um, but uh, he's well uh, 
he's, he's been to a lot of uh, just, uh, workshops and camps and, and so forth. So he's really quite in to those traditions. And I feel like he does a really quite nice job of laying out the, the four, uh, I'm not, I'm probably not gonna be able to dig up those four Bra Brahma Viharas off, certainly not the, uh, the Sanskrit names or whatever, but, uh, but, um, uh, he goes over the various aspects of, of Buddhist reflections on compassion and mindfulness and, uh, you know, of particular interest, uh, the one that really, uh, interests me is, um, ooh, I can't think what to call the Brahma. Let's see. Uh, so there's the idea of, um, Oh, I just can't remember, darn it. it. It's a really good idea, too, though. It's the idea of, of how do you react to another person's good fortune, right? So, oh, uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and I can't, can't quite remember. What the, like, the enemy of this would be jealousy or envy, right? Your good fortune makes me jealous. Well, that's clearly not the compassionate mind. But interestingly, a near enemy of this Brahma Bihara would be exuberance, which is one that kind of surprised me. Uh, so in other words, if I hear about an accomplishment of yours and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so excited. Yes. Turns out that's not the most, or at least according to this framework, that's not the most compassionate approach. Like my exuberance tends to become a bit more about me. Right. right? The fact that I'm all excited means my attention's kind of captured by how excited I am. Uh, the genuine compassion in this case would be where, oh, oh, it's a sympathetic joy is what it is. Uh, I feel joy out of understanding your good fortune, mm -hmm. right? Get all excited and I'm jumping up and down about your good fortune. That's not quite sympathetic joy because it's become a little bit more about my reaction to it. Mm -hmm. uh, That's again that model you have of where is the awareness and where is the attention that if exactly. a person has just had a success of some sense, some, in some sense, that they're, they're wanting to share that, they're wanting to be heard about that. And so you want to be present with them to hear it, to mm -hmm. feel into that, let them sort of explore it or, exactly. or share more of it till they feel sort of complete. And then, mm -hmm. uh, then, then you can share your own. So it, yeah. And that's the essence of the empathy circle as we do. It's like you listen to the person like, oh, I hear you're really excited. Is, is there more? Like, yeah, it's like mm -hmm. I've been working so hard at this. I've struggled so hard and now I'm having that success. So yeah, so you've really been struggling and you feel like finally it's paying off. Is there more? And so you right. just stay present with the person and then you can, in the empathy circle, you can kind of shift and say, well, I'm feeling pretty happy, you know, that you're doing this. And then the, the listener is kind of hearing you share right. yours. So how do we share you know, the deeper experiences uh, yeah. of each other. And that's sort of the core of the empathy circle is like just a kind of a basic structure for introducing some of the, some, some of that, those, uh, yeah. that way. So you it know, seems to resonate, overlap with, with what you're saying. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it makes me realize, you know, oftentimes when somebody tells me, oh, the, this happened and that made me so angry. I, I think what I tend to do is, Oh, you know, that something like that happened to me one time and I was right. Uh -huh. Now I'm talking about, I'm talking about because it, you mentioned it happened to you, but my thoughts have shifted now from it happening to you to what it was like when that happened to me. And, and not that that's not a valuable component in a conversation, but that's, that's not really the act of listening. That's yeah. that, taking on what you're saying, but then turning it into my own kind of. Uh, but you could, you could stay present with the other person and say, Oh, what does this mean for you? And you're kind of hearing to the full, you're kind of letting them kind of explore the experience in themselves, which is like a form of self-empathy. It's kind of like supporting self-empathy in the other person so they can fully express it. And then sort of shift. Then once they're kind of complete, then you have your turn as well. That, so, wow, that reminds you of this. And then you get heard. So it's really, again, I think that model you had of the attention, like where is the attention? How does it mm -hmm. shift? And then how do we, and a culture of empathy is getting away from the, just kind of grabbing attention. So it's a lot is really around attention. How is attention used? How is it used effectively? How do you just um, remove, uh, 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 you know, blocks? Like I have this, uh, we have this free empathy card that we give to people at the tent. Uh -huh. and, and I don't know if you can read that, but it says, 
no judgments, advice, analysis, detachment, diagnosing, sympathy, pity, or interruptions. <laughs> so those are all like the blocks to empathy, right? So yeah. it's like we're here, we're present for you to be heard, and once people feel fully heard, then the next step is to go into mutual because we want everybody in the in the group mm -hmm. to, to be heard. So, but it sounds like it overlaps with uh, this um, uh, with the compassion of pr that perspective too. So, yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um, then we have chapter ten: the, the language structure of social cognition and integrative process of becoming the other. J. A. Pinda. Pineda. 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 Singh. Singh yeah. And Christina Chepek. You know, I'm not even sure. I I've actually haven't met those. Uh, Jamie, uh, I, I know through online interaction uh -huh. at UC San Diego. Um, and he's, uh, he's kind of one of the leaders in, the, in that mu suppression, e.g. mu suppression research. Um, he's kind of one of the first people to make the strong case that it might reflect mirror neurons. Um, I, I will tell you this, this chapter was a bit of a surprise to us. Uh, I think we had asked, asked him to write, I believe we asked him to write chapter two, the chapter on empathy. And he was the first one to sub, of all the authors to submit his chapter. And when we got it, we thought, well, wait a minute, this isn't really strictly about empathy. Um, it's a <laughs> general high level theoretical function, uh, chapter about social interaction in general. So, um, so we reject the chapter. It's, it's a good chapter, but we realized, well, that's not going to be chapter two. So we just kind of moved it back to chapter 10. Um, and, and here, uh, this is written at a, at a very high conceptual level. And, and frankly, I myself have a bit uh, of a hard time following it. But, um, but he's really just, in Pineda in this chapter, is really just trying to give a grand scale model for how the brain enables us to interact with each other in, in empathic ways. And um, he starts, uh, talks about a term I'd never, you know, I've heard of hierarchy, but he also talks about a heterarchy, uh, you know, and so it's really just about the idea that empathy uh, is, is more or less, you take a bunch of more basic psychological functions and integrate these in the right order. And empathy is something that emerges from there. Um, but that's probably about the best I could do with that chapter, to be honest with you. It's okay. Like, then we have a little harder to understand. So. The more theoretical, yeah. harder to comprehend. So a chapter, and then we end with chapter 11, where caring for self and other lives in the brain and how it can be enhanced and diminished observations on the neuroscience of empathy, compassion, self-compassion. And that's with you and Larry Stevens again. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and so on that one, uh, we're just trying to recap stuff, uh, you know, go through a little bit of an overview of it. Uh, Larry used this, uh, toad uh what was it i can't remember the wild toad ride or something from disneyland which i'd never even heard of so uh so that's his interesting little analogy to kind of take us through each of the chapters in a summary fashion uh but so we summarize and then uh and then we start giving some of our own kind of um uh inferences kind of what what do we see as what's been covered in this book what can this tell us about empathy and that's like i said where i put that empathy to compassion model in um which, uh, which again, just describes empathy as, uh, as well, it, it, it models the problem going from empathizing with someone to feeling compassion for someone by modeling the focus of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so my, uh, I guess my hypothesis is that for those first milliseconds, tens or maybe even a hundred milliseconds or so, um, that we are experiencing another person, let's say pain in this case, uh, if I'm experiencing another person's pain, the first hundred milliseconds or whatever of that that time period are me feeling that pain as if it's my own pain. Um, but if I manage to do that self other discrimination and reckon, oh wait, this is I don't feel pain because I'm in pain. I feel pain because that person's in pain. I can now shift my attention over to them. At which point I've gone from that emotional contagion to genuine empathy. Um, and then after that, I've suggested that we can go through a state of sympathy, which is a matter of oscillating back and forth between self-focus and other focus. Because with sympathy, I'm not just simply feeling what you feel. I'm feeling how I feel about the way you feel. 
right? So I'm kind of going back and forth. You feel this way, that makes me feel this way. You feel this way, it makes me feel that way. I'm just kind of understanding it that way. Um, but I would say, I would argue that in sympathy, more time, more attentional time is spent in understanding how you feel about their feelings than in, is spent understanding how they feel about their feelings. Whereas when you transition eventually into compassion, it's still, you know, at first I thought, okay, compassion is completely other focused. But uh, Larry disagreed with that and kind of convinced me that, well, no, compassion is something that you feel. You know, the kind of the most standard definition is um, uh, a recognition of someone else's, uh, what do we use to say, pain or misery, uh, um, and, and a desire to alleviate that misery. And so that desire to alleviate, well, that's my desire, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so clearly when I'm experiencing compassion, I must be thinking a little bit at least about how I feel but I like to think of it as most of my time is spent thinking about you when I'm feeling compassion for you, but that it wouldn't be compassion if I didn't also process um, the way I'm feeling about the way you feel. So I view it somewhat similar to sympathy, but I'd say sympathy, you spend more time thinking about how you feel about the situation, whereas with compassion, you spend more of the time thinking about the other person. Well, this, I, I love that, that uh, model you had because uh, there's a lot of confusion in this area and creating these models, you know, starts, it's like, how do we articulate this so that the, the lay person can easily understand that there's, I haven't seen any really clear models that it can kind of have a typology of what we're talking about and start getting some clarity, especially that it's just easy for anyone to kind of grasp. You know, mm -hmm. so I really appreciate this, you know, just the attention, you know, trying to make sense of this. And right. I, think that, I think that it's a, a, it's really a discussion, a whole chap, a whole discussion, if you have time, just on that aspect, you know, looking at it. And it seems like there's a need for a, a larger group to get together. It's like, how do we make this more clear and make it more accessible? Because I find that there's this, this uh, muddlement in terms of what are we talking about causes so much uh, confusion within the culture. For example, Barack Obama said he was gonna choose the Supreme Court justice that had empathy is one of their uh, ca capacities, you know? And, mm -hmm. and the, the conservatives read that as meaning, oh, we're gonna feel, you're gonna feel sorry for the poor at my expense, or mm -hmm. it means that you're gonna be all emotional you know, and you know, that that's what it means. So there was a real confusion about what the heck we we're even talking about and it never got cleared up, you know? Yeah. So if there was like some real focus on, let's really create simple, accessible models of what these different terms mean, it would it'd be a huge, you know, for moving all this forward. And, and I really appreciated, you know, your, your attempt at creating different ways of, of modeling uh, this so good I'm glad you found that effective that's honestly you're the first person I've talked to about that model mm -hmm. um, looked at it so it's nice to hear that feed yeah it's bookmarked <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> so I appreciate the the attempt so maybe we'll heck if you're up for it so going forward yeah appreciate the you know the time for and going over on this because it was really a, it's a dense book it really covers a lot and uh, so two, one is I'd like, love to talk to you more about empathy circles, maybe doing some tests, and even if you and some of your group would like to take part in them, so you actually have the experience yeah. of it. Right, right. Uh -huh. And then two, uh, you know, looking at maybe the definitions at some point, you know, mm -hmm. maybe doing, maybe even doing an empathy circle around using, around talking about mm -hmm. definitions or something. So, we, so two people that have those different definitions of empathy, can you? can talk with each other. Yeah, so that would be it. So, so yeah, it's that, it. yeah. So if you're, it sounds like you're up for that. So, mm -hmm. or, so. okay, well then I better call, call it, bring it to a close. We've gone an hour and a half, but uh, it's been very, I, I, I just really enjoy the way you think about this and the nuances and it's been a real pleasure uh, talking to you and look forward to continuing the discussion going forward as well. Yeah. Same here, and I, I really am fascinated by your work as, as well. It's just, I just, I'm glad there's somebody out there trying to take it beyond the, the academic to actually implement it. You know, that's our, a scientists don't always do a real good job of that side. You know? um, but yeah, thank you very much.